stream. Uh, we're thankful for your presence as well. Thank you for assembling with us in spirit, if not in person. Now today, um, we're kind of going to go a little off script, and uh, I don't have a PowerPoint or anything. Uh, I did actually prepare a sermon. Uh, I spent this entire week preparing it, and then uh, I had a PowerPoint ready and scheduled to go, and then something really weird happened to me Friday night. So like many of you guys, um, I was sitting in bed on Friday night and sitting on my computer, and I was thinking about Jim Rodenbeck, um, especially in light of his sudden passing. And actually, I've, I've thought about him the entire week, you know, uh, thinking about memories of Jim. Many of you guys knew Jim, were friends with Jim, uh, had various bouts of crying throughout the week, uh, like many of you. And just kind of realizing it's, you know, it's been a hard year. Uh, it's been a hard week. It's been maybe a harder week for you. I, I don't even know what are some of the things that you have been going through, but uh, we think about just how recent Ed's passing has been and how even the week prior, we had had a tribute for him on Wednesday. We sang one of the songs he was well known for singing. And then just this Wednesday, we get the news about Jim Rodenbeck. Uh, just a little over 50. I mean, still really in, in a lot of ways, a young man leaving behind Stacy, who he's been married to for five years and two very, very small children. Uh, and Amber and I were really close friends with Stacy and Jim. Uh, they were frequently at our home before they moved down to Searcy, Arkansas for Stacy to work at Harding University as a biology teacher. And, um, you know, every time they came back up to town, like the Bonds, they would often drop by our house. I mean, we visited all the time. We'd spend an entire afternoon talking theology. I think about uh, the times that Amber and I would go visit and uh, see Jim play. You guys know he was a, a huge trombone player. And so we'd like to go do that. Uh, I was at his bachelor party, Christian bachelor party, um, where he went to go and we, we saw Butler play, right? We, had a, we saw a Butler game. And uh, if you didn't know Jim, uh, he was like the dad you never had. He was tall, lanky, always telling a dad joke, uh, ridiculous puns, and a hard eye rolls all the time. But the biggest thing that anybody knows about Jim is that he loved the Lord, right? We talked theology for hours, sharing commentaries. I mean, he just, he just loved the Lord. Well, Friday night, anyway, uh, while I was hunting for memories to share, for some reason, I decided to get on my email list. And I keep all of my emails. I know some of you guys are incessant about deleting all your emails. I have like 100,000 emails, right? And the reason why is that that's my memory bank, okay? I keep all my emails. And even though I corresponded with Jim mainly through texting, I did check to see if maybe there was some way in which we had corresponded through email, maybe somewhere he was mentioned, and it yielded one email, one email from Brass World at AOL, and uh, it was a sermon that he had sent me, a sermon that Jim wanted to send me because of something that I had re preached recently that he wanted to share with me, some camaraderie there. And check this, he sent it to me on July 15th, 2016 which is his birthday. And the only reason why I know that is because Jim shares the same birthday as my mom. And so exactly four years ago, he had sent this sermon. And as I read through it on Friday night, I found myself strangely encouraged by what he had had to say, encouraging me about his own death. And I found that he said some things that I need to hear in my depression and in my grief and in the way that 2020 has just been going for all of us. And I realized that Jim, in this sermon that he had written, uh, I couldn't help but think about that passage in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 4, where it's speaking about Abel and it says that through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. The title of his sermon is called Thriving in the Midst of Depression. It's preached on July 3rd, 2016 at Miller's Mary Manor, which is a nursing home in Warsaw, which tells you a little bit about his character. That's the kind of guy Jim was. 
He was not a professional minister in any capacity, but he would go to nursing homes and preach and share the gospel. And so um, I'm going to preach this sermon so you can hear his voice and hopefully be comforted in the same way that I was. I want to invite you to turn your Bible to 1 Kings chapter 19. His sermon, Thriving in the Midst of Depression, is based on a text in 1 Kings chapter 19. So let's all be turning there together in our Bibles. And I want to start reading in verse 1. 1 Kings chapter 19 and in verse 1. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah the prophet had done, and how he had killed all the prophets of Baal with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid, and he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones in a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. And there he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And he said, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And, be and behold, the Lord passed by in a great and strong wind toward the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I've been very jealous for the Lord, Yahweh, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel Mahola, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael shall Jehu put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. And this is the word of the Lord. Jim writes, this morning we are going to examine an Old Testament prophet who experienced depression. And that prophet's name is Elijah. And our goal this morning is twofold. He has two main points to his sermon. First, we want to examine, A, how depression was manifested in Elijah's life. And then B, how depression was actually a friend to Elijah in the end. So two major points for today. 
Now, to really understand where Jim's coming from, really what this text is doing, what the author of 1 Kings is trying to communicate, we have to put Elijah in this story in particular, in 1 Kings 19, in its proper context, okay? We have to understand the grand scope of what's been happening in this book, uh, even beginning with 1 Kings chapter 17, the ministry of Elijah, to what's happening now. Now, probably the most important thing we need to know is that at this point, the whole scope of God's people have been divided between Israel and Judah, the two kingdoms to the south, and the ten kingdoms in the north. And pretty much for the entire reign of Israel, the ten kingdoms in the north, there are no good kings, right? And Ahab, this joker, is one of the worst, okay? He even marries Jezebel, who is a, a daughter of a religious individual who rules over Tyre and Sidon. She brings about all this harlotry and all this idolatry into the kingdom of Israel. She's a She's a, I mean, that's why we, you know, when we call somebody a Jezebel, we, we know we're talking about a biblical person here, right? Not very nice. And Elijah is sent as a prophet to Israel to rebuke Ahab, to rebuke Jezebel. And it all comes to this climax in a chapter prior in 1 Kings chapter 18, in a story maybe you heard at a VBS or maybe on the flannel graph in your Bible classes whenever you were young. But we have this story of Elijah, the prophet of Yahweh, facing, having a smackdown with the 450 prophets of Baal. And they agree in this contest of champions, right? They agree that whichever God answers by fire this sacrifice on this altar, let that one be the true God. And they prepare the sacrifice. The 450 prophets of Baal beg their God to answer. He doesn't answer. Elijah cracks some jokes like the stand-up comedian prophet that he was. And uh, finally, God answers his request, consumes, licks up the water, licks up the sacrifice, and then they slaughter the 450 prophets of Baal. And it's a great victory, right? It's, it's this great climax zenith moment in his career. And the very next chapter knows what happens. It's almost like this, 2019, 2019, 2019, 2020. Chapter 19, Jezebel wants to kill him. And he wants to take his life. He, he, he doesn't want to live anymore. Jim writes, well, it certainly sounds like Elijah was having a good day. However, his happiness was short-lived. Depression overtook Elijah's joy. And when Ahab informed Jezebel of Elijah's victory, she vowed to take Elijah's life. He fled. And the story of his depression picks up in 1 Kings 19 and verse 4, where we learn that he felt like giving up, which is the first of three ways in which this depression began to manifest in Elijah's life. You read there in verse four, he went a day's journey into the wilderness, came, sat down underneath a broom tree, which is kind of like a bush. And he asked that he might die saying, it's enough now, O Lord, take away my life for I am no better than my father's. Elijah, you have to feel what he's feeling. He is overwhelmed with grief. I don't know if you've ever had such a difficult thing happen to you. Maybe 2020 has been this way where you just get to the point to where everything's banal, food doesn't even taste the same, it's so difficult, you have lost the will to live, right? You're like, I'm done, you know, let's move on to the next thing. There are people who feel that way because of their grief, and that's what Elijah's feeling here. Even though he had that great victory on Mount Carmel, and it's easy to ask the question, you know, how? How after his great victory could he feel like this? Could he read this, he goes from zenith to nadir, how does that happen? But then again, if you look at our lives, doesn't that happen to all of us? Isn't that the way that we act? The problems of today so easily eclipse the great successes of yesterday. That's just what it means to be human. Elijah felt useless. He felt like giving up. This man was so great that he's one of the few in the entire Bible who is taken to heaven alive in a chariot. And yet even he could feel like this. For me, that's encouraging to hear it. Even Elijah got discouraged at this point. Here's the second way. Not only did he feel like giving up, but he compared his life to others. Now, did you notice that at the tail end of verse 4? Look again. Notice that in the midst of his depression, he's, comparing, he's saying, look, I'm no better than my father's. I'm no better than my father's. Now, we don't, we don't know exactly why he's saying this, 
Jim surmises that maybe it has to do with the fact that he thought he could unite Israel based on some things that Malachi writes about Elijah. It could be that he felt faithless. It could be that um, he's losing the will to live in the same way that Moses would often say things like that in the book of Numbers because he was so tired of dealing with the hard-hearted people like Israel. No matter what it is, he's comparing himself. Now, who in here, whenever you're going through a slump, doesn't compare yourself to other people? You know what I'm talking about, everybody, right? You're feeling bad about yourself. You've completely ruined your day because I don't know, you spent six hours on YouTube and you get on Facebook and you see pictures of people who are just killing it, man. As a parent, as a father, as a mother, people who are getting it done and you feel awful, right? You feel awful because you're thinking, man, I, I've been a Christian longer than this person and this, that, and the other. And you play this comparison game, which is absolute nonsense because the Bible never has us compare ourselves to other people. It's always a place for the ego to be stirred and for pride to bring you down. The standard has always been God himself, right? Because God has promised to make us like him. And if you have to compare yourself to anyone else, let it be to who you were yesterday. That's the only person you have any business comparing yourself to, not to other people. And that's the game that Elijah's playing here. No wonder he's depressed. 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 10. I want you to take a look at that phrase or that passage one more time. Now, this is where Elijah is speaking to the Lord. And notice what he says. He says, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel, forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left. And they seek my life to take it away. Elijah felt like giving up. He compared his life to others. But thirdly, the last way in which he manifests his depression is that at the very end of the verse, he says, I feel alone in this failure. Now you compound that by the isolation, the social distancing, the pandemic quarantine mess that we've been in in 2020. Who in here doesn't feel alone? Who in here has not almost learned to thrive as an introverted hermit that doesn't get out to talk to anybody, right? If Walmart will deliver my groceries, buddy. But we need each other. We're a church. We're supposed to be with each other. We're supposed to encourage each other. We're supposed to hug each other. This is very strange what we're living through. Yeah, we feel alone. And we tell ourselves, you know, no one's going through what I'm going through. No one cries the way that I cry about this. No, no one understands what, what I feel like. And it's, it's not true. It's not true. Now, as we transition to the second part, we've seen how depression is manifested in the life of Elijah. But now let's look at how depression was actually a friend of Elijah. Now, it might be easy to see depression manifest in his life, but how did depression actually serve him, right? How can, how can that be that depression was a friend to Elijah? Jim writes, I believe the answer is found in the answer to another question. How did Elijah survive depression? Well, I don't think Elijah merely survived depression. I think he thrived in the midst of his depression. Specifically, he sees four ways in which depression was actually a friend to Elijah. First Kings chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. Let's look at it one more time. First Kings 19, verses 5 through 6. Remember, he's run away from Jezebel, and here's what it says. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel appeared to him, touched him, and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. The very first way in which Elijah survived depression, thrived through it, it was a friend to him, is that, number one, he practiced self-care. You know, as Christians, we're super good about spiritualizing everything. We're super good about talking about the division of body and spirit and how we're a soul. And one day we're just going to fly up to heaven and and leave this body behind and that kind of thing. And we don't, we don't think about the fact that we're embodied now. God created us that way. And a lot of the way of how you feel and your attitude, even though it shouldn't be completely dependent upon your body functions, it is tied to how you treat your body. And the first thing we see here whenever God cares for him is he doesn't just give him some spiritual mumbo jumbo to begin with. What he does is he says, how about you eat something? How about you take a drink? 
And so he rests under the shade provided by the broom tree and ate food provided by the angel. You know, I was talking to Mike Sullivan earlier this week about how sometimes your health, you get into like this weird catch-22 because, you know, I've not really been feeling well lately and, and like many of you. And what's interesting is that, you know, you tell yourself, well, maybe if I felt better, I could start exercising, right, to get my health in check. But then you almost wonder, well, if I started exercising, would that make me feel better, right? So which one do we start with? And it's, it's difficult to play that game with yourself. But we do need to have time. And listen to me carefully, okay? Because some of you guys need to hear this. Some of you guys need to give yourself permission. There is time for rest and food. There is time to take care of yourself. And don't think by, by doing something for yourself, that is innately selfish. I think about flying on an airplane, right? And you know those masks that drop out from the ceiling? What do they always say? Put yours on before you put on anyone else's because you're going to collapse. Sometimes it's that way in life. It's not selfish to minister to self so that we might be able to minister to other people. Now, of course, uh, the way that we live like Christ is not fully contingent on our physical health. We see that in 2 Corinthians 12 with the way that Paul spoke about his weaknesses. Of course, I get that. But if you can, practice self-care. The second thing that he did, Jim says, is that he saw depression as a journey rather than a destination. He saw depression as a journey rather than a destination. I don't know about you, but I needed to hear that. That this isn't just some state you stay in, inevitably. It will end. You see here, although Elijah was discouraged and ready to give up and die, the angel said something interesting in verse 7. Arise, eat, because the journey is too great for you. The journey is too great for you. Elijah was on a journey. And even though he was weak and depressed, he continued his journey, a long journey through the desert to Mount Hori or Mount Sinai. And he says, when we are depressed, it is so tempting to see that depression is the end of the road. But in reality, it is our journey through the desert to the mountain. Jim goes on to write, Elijah, viewing of his depression as a journey rather than a destination, reminds me of a verse in Psalm 42. In Psalm 42, in verse 7, it says, Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls, and all of your breakers and your waves have gone over me. The psalmist speaking to God. Deep calls to deep. The psalmist is expressing that the depth of God's faithfulness, the depth of God's faithfulness, is proportional to the depth of our suffering. The famous preacher Charles Spurgeon addressed this very phenomenon in one of his sermons. Now he quotes Charles Spurgeon here in, in a quote that is just amazing. Okay, here, listen to what he says, quote, Inasmuch as you have many trials, remember the depth of divine faithfulness. You have not been able to comprehend the reason for your trials. But I beseech you to believe in the firmness and stability of the divine affection towards you, of God's love towards you. In proportion to your tribulations shall be your consolations. If you have shallow sorrows, you shall receive but shallow graces. But if you have deep afflictions, you shall obtain the deeper proofs of the faithfulness of God. I could gladly lay down and die whenever I think about the trials of this life, but I recover myself and laugh at them all, even as the daughter of Zion shook her head and laughed at her foes, when I remember that the mighty God of Jacob is our refuge, and that he will not fail us, nor take away his hand till he has brought about his purpose concerning us. Great deeps of trial bring with them great deeps of promise. Amen. Depression is not a destination. Depression is something we experience as a part of a greater journey. And we're going to do, listen to me, brothers and sisters, if you're going through a circumstantial depression, I'm not talking about clinical depression. If you're going through a circumstantial depression because of how difficult this year has been, we're going to do what God's people have always done. We're not going to stop. We're going to keep walking through it. I don't remember who it was that said that if you're going through hell, keep walking. It might have been G.K. Chesterton or Winston Churchill, another Englishman. But... That's the point. Number three, 
He says another key to Elijah's thriving in the midst of depression is that he put himself in a place in order to hear God speak. Number three, he put himself in a place in order to hear God speak. I needed to hear that. 1 Kings 19, verses 8 through 9. So he arose, ate, and drank, and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. And then he came there to a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah went to Mount Horeb where God could speak to him. Interestingly, Elijah probably should never have made the journey to Mount Horeb seeking answers because at Mount Carmel, he received all the proof he should have needed that God was with him. And that's why God asked him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Still, Elijah, in making this journey, was seeking to find answers from God. Despite his depression, he strove to put himself in a place where we could hear God speak. Now, and, and, and this is really kind of a strange passage. You guys were probably thinking this as we read through it, but notice whenever he appears, he knows God is present. That's why he covers his face with a veil, right? He, he knows the story of Moses. And when he goes out to meet God, notice that there's this great strong wind, but God was not in the wind. There was this great strong earthquake, God was not in the earthquake. There was great strong fire, God was not in the fire. But then, a still, small voice, a whisper, and God spoke. Sometimes it is not in the great showing, like what happened at Mount Carmel, 1 Kings chapter 18, that God reveals himself. Sometimes we want a mountaintop moment, but that doesn't always happen like that. A lot of times God is found in the ordinary and in the faithful and in the consistent. That's how he revealed himself to Elijah in this moment. And in Elijah's determination to seek God's presence, he received new information. Number four, he received new information, in this case, reassuring information. Here's the information Elijah believes. So he's developing a contrast. What, here's what Elijah believed. He says, quote, I alone am left. They seek my life to take it away. The new information Elijah received is in verse 18, where God says, startlingly, yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed them. You think you're alone in this, Elijah. You're the only one. Brother, I've, I've reserved 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. The Lord informed Elijah there were still 7,000 people who were true to the Lord. 7,000 who did not worship Baal. And that knowledge, just knowing he was not alone, revived Elijah's spirit. So, we have examined Elijah's experience with depression. We have learned how he felt like giving up how he compared his life to others, how he felt alone. Maybe you have had similar times in your life, Jim writes, maybe even right now. How did you handle those times, Jim asks. How should you handle your bouts of depression? If you follow Elijah's example, you will practice self-care. In other words, you will make the most of what you have. It could be as simple as eating, exercising, sticking with medication if that helps. You work with what you have and do what you can do. If you follow Elijah's example, you will see depression as a journey rather than a destination, focusing on where you need to be rather than where you are at the moment. If you follow Elijah's example, you will put yourself in a place where you can hear God speak, which we've all even done today. And when depression sets in, that it is not time to go it alone. Turn to God, pray to him, read scripture for encouragement. Find friends who can help you through your depression by lending you their sympathetic ears and encouraging you to take steps toward your goals, towards the goals God gives you. Now listen to this. When you allow yourself to be in a place where God can speak to you, you will very often receive new information. This is the sentence that got me. Sometimes that information will help you to see that God is working through you in ways you aren't expecting. Oh, Jim. And so God works through Jim in a way he would never have expected. 
And through his faith, he still speaks. Bow your heads with me as we go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Father, we we thank you for allowing us to be here today that we might gather again as a testimony of our faith and out of urgency and our need uh, for our brethren and for your grace and for encouragement. We're thankful for this moment in which we could sing with each other and pray together, sit at the Lord's table together. But Father, um, as Ken had even said earlier, our hearts are hurting and we come to you out of faith knowing that you can comfort. So God, please be with us and be with Jim's family at this time. Father, we pray that you would open a window in heaven and rain all the blessings as we could even imagine beyond what we can imagine upon Stacy Rodenbeck, upon Susan, upon Christian. Father, take care of them, anticipate their needs, lift up their hands, give them bravery and courage and strength for the days ahead. And may your church continue to shower love and to build them up. And Father, we ask that by your Holy Spirit, you would be swift to encourage us. Make us strong. Help us to get through this journey. Help us to see it as a journey. Help us to take care of ourselves. Help us to hear your voice and to have the strength to move on, Father, for we, we are not capable. This journey is too great for us. But we know that you go ahead of us, Father, and so we follow. Thank you, dear Lord, we pray in the name of Christ and amen. If you're not a Christian this morning, we also want to extend the invitation uh, to be baptized, to be immersed in the water for the forgiveness of your sins. Um, or if you just need the prayers of the church, if, if you feel like there's conviction upon your heart, we want to be able to help you in any way possible. Um, why don't you come right now while we stand and sing this song for your, your encouragement. <laughs>